Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Report. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. I'm so excited today. This is finally a tequila conversation. We have not had a lot of these ironically on Turmeric and Tequila, uh, but there's not really a lot of humans out there that know tequila, the industry, the science behind it, the history of the plants, how it impacts uh, the environment, the agriculture, all like the details of it. So we have a tequila aficionado to say the least. It's Mike Morales. He actually reached out to me. I thought we had met at PodFest, but it was actually just in a, a digital connection, which is so exciting to me. So there's a pot, the upside of social media, which nowadays, you know, those are sometimes hard to find, but the quick 411 on Mike, he's an author, an Amazon bestseller, a tequila teacher, a Mezcal mentor, a cigar Cigar smoker, a cappuccino yeah. lover, and a dog, a cat daddy. I Freudian slip. I have three dogs, so I immediately go to dogs. But he he is a cat dad. Yeah. Um, but in and and he knows Dino, who was on Turmeric and Tequila. I don't know what episode it was, but Tequila Undiscovered. So I'm seeing how small this tequila world is, and it's really cool to see this passionate community. Without further ado, Mike, welcome to TNT. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm so happy to finally you know connect with you, and and yeah, it's um. Uh, you you realize it, you know, it's a big industry, but it's a really a small world, yes. uh, especially when it comes to tequila. And and you know you've got that perfect title. You know <laughs> we those of us who are uh, on the internet, you know, and, and have a, a tequila background for one reason or the other, they they that's the key word you search for, and and your yours yours you know shows up right at the top. So that makes me so um, happy. And the fact that you're you're an athlete, you know, you're you're uh, you do CrossFit, yeah. which I, I don't have the guts to do. Um, <laughs> and that you're a beast. I've seen your your squats and your snatches and all that. Like my God, you know, uh, your deadlifts. And what I really enjoy is that when I see you, you know, in training, uh, having been a, a health instructor myself years years ago. Uh, we were talking on camera. I used to work for a health club here in Southern California, a chain of health clubs that eventually became Bally's. And, and I really enjoy, I didn't get a chance to do it as much back then like I, like I do now. But uh, for some reason, you know, at that time, uh, women were a little, um, uh, they were, they were um, maybe put off or a little scared of having a guy teach them sure. exercises. And what I discovered when I got a chance to do it, which was very rare, women were more interested in the form and the function. They wanted to know if they were doing it right. And, and then once they got the form down, then they would start racking up the weight. And, and I, and I see that in you because your form is flawless. It's <laughs> wow. flawless. I even, you know, YouTube, some, people, you, some watched, YouTube viewers would not agree, but yeah, thank you. I, I, watched, your, I watched your deadlift. <laughs> I watched you do a deadlift and you know, you can grip like this, your bar like that. Yeah. Some, some men do that, but a, an actual deadlift grip is like this. Yeah. And I watched where your hands were and I thought yeah. somebody's teaching her right. Yeah. And I love it, you know, because, because that, that's, that's been my experience. And now, you know, after 23 years of, of tequila tasting, we, we've been, uh, July will be our 23rd year in business of uh, doing tequila tasting online. So, you know, when the pandemic hit, we were like, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. doing it. We, we invented it and, <laughs> and people were doing it on Instagram. And that's where a lot of the um, uh, so-called influencers came into, you know, it, it came into um, uh, connecting with each other. And, and, uh, and we watched a lot of them and, and, your, your name popped up, like you said, at the very top. And it's like, wait a minute, she's a margarita person. But where's, your, where's your tequila? You know, I don't know what's in your cup. <laughs> you know, yeah. it could be a slushy. It could be protein. You know, like mine's it's, coffee. But it's people, both. Yeah. People always ask me, it's like, you know, it, you have tequila in your coffee. And go, you'll never know. Right. Well, that's I, that's funny. I just did like a TikTok video. We're leaning more into the videos, but um, like you, I'm a, my age range is a little bit outside of all these new and upcoming platforms. But we're leaning in. I actually I love it because there's a lot 
that's not so great about it. But on the flip side for startup brands like us or companies or someone that just wants to use their voice, it's such an incredible opportunity and a platform to take advantage of that we never had back in the day. But it's, um, I don't, I've specifically, that's interesting you say that, not promoted any sort of brand or my favorites because I want to hold that space for my partner down the road. I've been very intentional about not monetizing the podcast, not monetizing any, I pay for all this because I wanted it to be really pure and intentional. And I, I knew we had to get some laps and reps under our belt, just like training before we, you know, put it out there. But I really do. I'm going to be very intentional about who I partner. With. I absolutely want a tequila sponsor at one point that I genuinely love and endorse, but also like we'll, we'll talk a little about today. Um, but they're intentional in this world. They're showing up, they're having conversations around sustainability. Um, they have, you know, diversity and inclusion with their company structure. Like I want, we will have that, but I've intentionally not promoted anything yet even my favorites. A couple of times guests will ask me and I'll say, but I really keep it kind of off the air because I want to hold that space for the right uh, company, the right partner down the road. That's, we do the same thing. We, we actually, um, every year uh, since 2013, we now uh, bestow awards uh, that we call Brands of Promise. We, we only, um, I seek a lot of startup brands. You know, nice. a, lot of, a lot of the mainstream brands don't need us and, and I don't need them. Uh, we've ne- in fact, in any of re- our reviews, we have the FTC disclaimer on every video. We've never been paid a dime for any of our reviews because there's a lot of people that actually get paid for a positive. Oh, for review. sure. We don't do any of that. We've never done it. It's something that uh, the founder of the of the website and myself had said, you know, aren't we're not going to do that. Good for you guys. And and so, uh, but we do have a magazine and we do put out books. And yeah. so when. We, when a brand is nominated as a brand of promise, and I have, I have 13 tasters, 12 in the United States, one in the UK, uh, and we're all over the place. And when one of them nominates a brand that we, that we uh, do the review, then they are qualified to actually buy an ad in our magazine. So not everybody qualifies. That's awesome. And, and that's the way we wanted to do it because we know that you know, these brands that you hear about, the mainstream brands, and people always ask me the same thing. What's your favorite tequila? And I always mm-hmm. say my next one. Yeah. Love that's, it. that's like the best, that's the best way to weasel out of that question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they, they have these marketing budgets and you're a branding person, yep. you're a marketing person, you know, these budgets are out <laughs> crazy, you know, and, and the small startup brands don't have that budget. They have to be really careful. Even, even when they're sending stuff to the so-called influencers on Instagram or TikTok, they got to be real careful because, you know, what kind of market are, are, are they going after? And then I, I, I lurk, I lurk on every platform because we're on every platform and we're everywhere from LinkedIn to Pinterest, we're everywhere. And some of these people that I've seen really have a tendency to give out misinformation and disinformation. And I call those, um, in baseball, I'm a big baseball guy. Um, we call those errors errors of uh, commission. You know, they're so enthusiastic that they'll say something, they'll blurt something without having done the background and knowing what they're talking about. They just, you know, automatically claim that there are additives in something that that really doesn't have it. Okay, and and that's just because they don't have the experience. They haven't done the background check, but people, have, their followers will watch that and go, yeah. oh, I don't want that brand or I'm not going to, you know, and it's incorrect. Yeah. Um, and, and by the same token, a lot, of, a lot of companies have really slick marketing and they'll feed you stuff, fluff, mm-hmm. that, um, that other people will buy, you know, they'll, they'll read it and go, oh, that's how you guys are doing it. You're infusing uh, an additive by using air. And it's like, that's, that's impossible. But I've seen it. I've seen it in copy that's been sent to me. Copy being the print or the text. Uh, I'm a trained copywriter. So it's like, you know, that, uh, that's our jargon for that. It's copy. And they'll sell me fluff and I'll go, that's incorrect. You're not going to, you're not going to let me say this on the, on the air. Sometimes I'll read it on the air just to, just to, um, just to trash whoever it was they hired to write them. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.
Uh, there are kosher tequilas. I was just talking to Kristen offline and said, you know, there's kosher tequila now. There's organic tequila now uh, that's certified by the USDA. We didn't have any of that when we started. We had Jose Cuervo. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You know, we had 1800, which, which and was they're, they're, Jose Cuervo. <clears throat> those, and that was like big, huge marketing and brand partnerships. They had hotels, they had everybody. Before we get into the business, though, I really, I don't want to just, I really want people to understand how accredited your ethos are in this industry. So give me a little bit, like even why, like why tequila, how you initially started it. And then where did this passion come from? And then so give us the why, the passion, and then the all the things, the like the quick 411 and all the things you're in right now. Because I just want people to understand how how much you really do know. Uh, well, uh, I started uh, when I was living in New Mexico. I, I, I lived there for 18 years, and I still love it. I still miss it. Um, I, um, I had the, the woman I was living with at the time um, was, uh, was a Patron drinker. Okay, some of us cut our teeth on, on stuff. And I was a rum drinker. I, I, my folks are from Central America. So we had rum in the house all the time. Oh, interesting. And so I was not a big tequila person, but um, I wanted to go every year in Albuquerque. Uh, uh, there, there's a wine show that happens in September. And, and I wanted to go and she never wanted to go. And then finally she gave, she caved in and we were there and we had a great time. In fact, she bought like four bottles of wine. You know, it was like, you're not a wine drinker. <laughs> um, but when we were there, we ran into a couple of friends of mine who were in radio with me. And she ran into a couple of people uh, that worked with her. She was a travel agent. And so we all kind of hooked up at the show, not knowing we were going to be there. And afterwards, you know, we, we went to uh, uh, one of the friend's house who had a pool because it was a hot day that day. It was an Indian summer. So it was very, very warm that day. And we're all hanging out by the pool. And uh, my friend in, who was in radio and myself, and then we had the other gentleman who was a, a general manager at a historic hotel in downtown Albuquerque. And he was a big mescal guy. And, and so we were all talking. He's like, what a great show. You know what? And then we all looked at each other and said, you know, would this be great if they did something like this for tequila? And we all kind of looked at each other like, you know, like the, like the Spider-Man meme. You know, we're all pointing <laughs> at each other. And, and I said, well, wait a minute. I can do the, the research you're still in radio. We can do, we can do the, you know, the, the, the radio ads. And he goes, well, I got a venue. We've been looking for something to bring people into the hotel. And a year to the day, uh, I was, we were all three of us were in front pitching the general manager of that hotel. It took a couple of pitches to get it right. And we, we uh, uh, managed to have the first tequila show ever in the United States before there were any other tequila shows ever. And it was, not knowing, uh, I, I said just recently, I think I saw my Instagram that I feel like the, uh, like the tequila Forrest Gump. I did not know that I was, I was conducting history. I was being a part of it because I was just trying to do a show. Uh, for those of you who, who are familiar with, with New Mexico, they have the largest balloon fiesta in the country. And it's famous. That. It happens in October and it's a big tourist draw. And I wanted something like that for that city because they had given me so much. At that time, I felt really grateful. So I, I wanted to do something similar, you know, that would attract people and tourists and things like that. Because New Mexico to this day still has like the third poorest, is considered the third poorest state in the union uh, and thrives on, on, on tourism. So uh, that's where it started. And in our fourth year, we had them lined up around the hotel trying to get in. We had, we had television, uh, local TV, you know, we had, um, uh, somehow our press release got into a, uh, an in-flight magazine. So we had oh. people coming in from out of state. If anybody, if you guys know, uh, how tough it is to get into an in-flight magazine, that's really hard to do. Uh, but somehow we wound up, you know, we wound up in one and we had people from Tennessee and, and from all across the country come to the show. Um, and that's where it started. That's, that's where, and I, at that point, had never been to a tequila distillery. It was all just research. Wow. At the time, in the we, I say that we grew up with the internet because there, at the time, there weren't that many um, people who had information on tequila. There was like one guy, and he was a Canadian, uh, oddly enough, who had researched all of it, and, and he had uh, the most, I think, the most detailed website uh, on on information on tequila, and there were a few others. But he was the main one, and and that's where it grew. Uh, and it eventually, I did. Uh, I became part of a tequila forum that was prior to Facebook. Okay, so we went from email newsletters to for to forums, 
and then Facebook happened at MySpace and then Facebook. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, from this tequila forum, there were 35 of us who had never met. We were from all parts of the country. And we got somebody, somebody took the reins and said, I can, I can arrange this to happen. And those of us who could afford it flew out to, to Mexico. And, and it was a, the, I call it the, the biggest blind date I've ever been on. Because there were 35 of us who had <laughs> conversed online, but we'd never met. And it was, it changed my life. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you go there and I tell that to anybody who's going to take a trip to Mexico and you're going to go see tequila and you're going to see a distillery. You, yeah, go see Jose Cuervo because that's Disneyland. Mm -hmm. But then go see, you know, uh, the small parks, you know, whatever. I forget which park is smaller there in, in, in Denver in, in Colorado, but there's some small like water parks, you know, that are really oh, fun, yeah. but nobody knows anybody, anything about them. And, and I say, go see both because you've got to see Disneyland, but you got to see where the small ones are because yeah. that's where the real stuff happens. And, you know, at that time, you, you, they're driving you from, from uh, the airport into Tequila, which is about like an hour drive. And, and you see the hillsides covered in blue agave. And, and the, 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 uh, the ground there is iron oxide. And so it's bright red. And it reminds me a lot of Northern New Mexico or maybe Southern Colorado. Because you know the 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 same the, those states share the same kind of terrain, sure. And um, and it's so bright and it's so green that it hurts your eyes. You have to you have to look at it with sunglasses on because it's so bright. It like it looks like it it feels like it burns your iris or something. And and just to see that, you know, and to see agave, you know, harvested, and to to taste a, a baked blue agave out of the out of the oven or an autoclave and you have a snifter of tequila you know because everybody's going to get going to be drinking whatever brand or distillery you're, you're at and you take that snifter it looks like this and you dip your 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 wedge of blue agave and and you sip you know the the tequila off of it and that imprints oh, wow. what tequila tastes like and smells like in your olfactory senses and it's very similar to when when they say baby ducks, when the first thing that they latch onto is the first thing they see, mm -hmm. you know, so you see like lots of videos where baby ducks are following cats and dogs and, you know, or humans. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. You, you're imprinting those. We as humans can, can imprint what tu turmeric or turmeric smells <laughs> like and tastes like and feels like, you know, by, by getting into it. And, and that's why, that's why I really enjoy, uh, I think, instructing uh primarily women in into this into this beautiful world because they get the form and function versus what's driving our market right now um for those of you who are tequila people and are watching this you've seen the, the headlines you know this year people will pay more for tequila than they'll pay for whiskey yeah. and then and then they're saying you know in the next couple of years uh uh Tequila is going to overtake vodka. And I, I'm here to tell you, I'm going to burst that bubble. Barron's is not going to like me. Uh, you know, Bloomberg is not going to like me. <laughs> all those, all those financial newspapers are not going to like me. That's not sustainable. Yeah. Okay? It's not good for the plant. It's not good for the industry and why they're pushing it. I don't get it. I don't understand. I think it's because it's selling. I mean, it's all these celebrities oh, yeah. stuff on, but I think also it's kind of like people drink it because like I drink it. Like I've felt the best off. I've really done my own research and AKA training many alcohols and trying what's like the best of the worst, like to balance out with training. And like you have your training days and you have your fun days, but I think it's just caught on to where it's like the cleanest, whether we know it's misinformation, disinformation, or the truth, people cling to that. And so, you know, companies will come in and they'll do anything to just satisfy the market and make a dollar. So I, I really, I, so I love that you shared that whole background and seeing the plant, seeing its origin, seeing like the why of where it came from, because tequila is really, um, I almost want to say like a romantic kind of uh, process and experience. And if you understand it, people, I think in college, tequila is like the cheap gross shooter that you give to like your freshman during initiation. That's like the American brand. But in reality, if you really understand the process, what it is, and I think why most of our bodies can tolerate it the best is because if you have the right stuff, it is so pure. But tell us more about, because historically, I actually think the consumer, women in, in the house are usually running households, so they're buying more in general. And in fitness, it's so funny because a lot of people in fitness are really, you're probably your biggest alcohol consumers it's a very funny juxtaposition oh yeah no that's but true that they celebrate you know what i i've said like i said i have friends that 
once they do a, 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 a meet or something, you know, they celebrate by drinking beer, you know, they, absolutely. You know, even mar- marathon runners, same thing, you know, they, they're having a beer, they carve up, you know? Because, yeah. Yeah. So the unit, the unit, you the guys unit. spend a lot of energy, you know, so I can see where carving up helps you, but you know, it, having a beer every night, it's just too many calories in beer for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not a daily, that's not my vibe anyways. It's not even like dodging calories. Me. That's just not my zone. It does impact my sleep. And as I was saying too, and I didn't really know the facts, I'd be like, I started drinking tequila because it was plant-based because I said like, it wasn't fermented like beer and wine, but you actually cracked me. And you're like, you know, it's been, it's fermented, but then distilled. So that was a good learning point for me, but my body just reacted so much different with beer, wine, and like what I call the basics, um, where tequila was a completely different thing. And even whiskey, like any, like the dark, dark, like yeah. wheat based or gluten filled kind of things. And even I've had people say, oh, alcohol is gluten free. So I'm not here to pick apart those details. I can just tell you what works for me. And that's what I tell people, even like nutrition or CrossFit versus yoga, find out really what works for you. Listen to all the science, listen to all the background, but really try it for yourself and see. Um, but tell us a little bit more about the sustainability and why that's not going to hang in there long term. Well, in the in the old days when we started, uh, you, and you'll see a lot of a lot of old descriptions and copy out there on the internet. They're still on websites. They say, "Oh, well, you know, we use seven year old plants. They have to grow seven or eight years in order to get the amount, the right amount of bricks, which is which is how they measure sugars in in blue agave. And and tequila can only be made with blue agave." For those of you who are mezcal drinkers, you can you have a variety of plants that are available to you. But tequila is the is really the first one to have a what they call a denomination of origin. Uh, it's like um, champagne can only be called champagne if it's coming from France. You know, Bordeaux can only come from Bordeaux. Uh, they call tequila the mo- the highest um, the most the ha- most highest regulated uh, spirit in the world, and yet. There's a lot of loopholes in, in, those, um, in those regulations and the rules and regs. For instance, it's the only tequila that allows itself to be adulterated. So, so there, they call this two classes of tequila. You have tequila, which is technically speaking uh, a, a, a liquid that is 51% blue agave, 49% other sugars. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's Jose Cuervo, that's Sousa, that's, and then you have. The other style of tequila, because that's how they call them, they term them styles of 100% blue agave tequila, or in Spanish, 100% de, de tequila, or 100% puro de tequila. Um, and, and that is just the plant, plant, water, and maybe wood, okay? That's it. And, you know, yeast, uh, they can throw yeast in there to accelerate the, the fermentation process, as I mentioned to you uh, on, on an email, it is fermented. And then once the fermentation happens and subsides, then they distill it. And that's where I say the magic happens in fermentation. Some people who are more, uh, uh, more into the distillation say, well, that's where the, that's where the, you know, the, the magic happens. And, and either way, there's magic in there somewhere. Okay? Yeah. And um, so, but now there are, you know, and, and again, the industry has changed. There, there are fluctuations in, in the amount of blue agave available and not available. So it happens, it's like a 10 year cycle. It's been happening since I've been watching the industry in, in, the, in the 90s, since we started having our show, uh, when we had our show in, in 2001 was our first show. And, and it's cyclical, okay? They haven't been able to figure out how much to plant and who's gonna plant it because, you know, in these in these area eras of glut and and scarcity, the pre, the people that that plan ahead of time make out like bandits, and many of those are agave farmers who eventually make their own brand. Yeah. They make their own tequilas, but they started as agave farmers, and that's where they made their money. And the brands that ha- that plant their own will always will always be around, but okay. many of the startup brands that don't have their own uh, farms. Those are the those are the people that are coming up now. The startup brands that they have to buy on the open market. You have to buy agave in the open market. Right now, it's really expensive. And with technology, a technology has come a long way. So instead of using brick ovens to, to bake blue agave, they use autoclaves, which is like a big pressure cooker. Mm-hmm. And now there's what they call a diffuser. And diffusers as big as a train. Okay, this thing. 
shreds and chops and shreds and chops makes it so, um, it, it actually started in the sugarcane industry. And it makes it so efficient that you don't need to wait for your plant to grow seven, eight years to get any kind of um, character, okay? Uh, character's gone out the door. Uh, the more modern tequilas that we're getting now are a lot softer, a lot smoother. They lack character. It's not anything like what I grew up with or even what you grew up with. Mm -hmm. And what I'm afraid of is that the new, the up and coming, you know, generation of drinkers, because the liquor industry knows that every 10 years, there's a new wave of drinkers, a new generation of whatever letter they're calling it. And they're, and they, they're studied to see how, what they're buying uh, habits are. And, and what I'm afraid of is that, that the newer drinkers are not going to know what real good tequila was like. And, and by the same token, they won't know what the real benefits are yeah. of a, a good 100% tequila, whether it's organic or whatever, because you're getting what we call microwave tequilas that are flooding the market. Um, you know, and like I say, there's a lot of loopholes in, in, the, in the manufacturing and producing of tequila that people are not aware of. And, and so after 20 some odd years of drinking and, and studying and learning from other people, we, myself and my business partner decided to come up with the Consumer Catador course, which is our course that gives people like you, like yourself, uh, and like how we started, kind of a, uh, a good basis of, of how tequila was used to be made and how it's made now. So these plants are not, people are, they, if you're going to overtake vodka, you can't wait for that plant to grow yeah. seven or eight years. They're harvesting plants at four years old. That plant does not have the characteristics. It hasn't been in the ground long enough to give you what you need as far as a flavor. And so, um, so it's going through this glorified diffuser shredder. Sometimes they have to use acid hydrolysis to convert the sugars. Oh. Okay, they're, some of them have acid. They're, they're doing them in the, um, they're spraying them with acid during the cooking process and then putting them through the shredder again. So it's like this goo that you're getting but you can distill that goo, right? But okay. what happens is now, and there's a big, within the tequila community, for those of you who are watching and are familiar with this, there was a big um, uh, crusade against tequilas with additives. All right, first I will tell you that, remember I told you that it's the highest regulated spirit in the world, but there are a lot of loopholes? Yeah. One of those loopholes is it allows for additives. That means that there's a certain percentage of caramel coloring, flavoring, aromatics that are allowed in the finished product. And they're being, I can tell you from having had so many tequilas now coming across our desks and being, you know, we get solicited, we solicit it every day. I get yeah. deliveries all the time. Um, the, there's stuff that we're getting. We're seeing more and more additives being used because they're trying to emulate what real tequila was kind of like. Yeah. And yeah. some of them are doing it quite well. I will say I had one yesterday that was actually very well done, even though they had additives. And there are others that are just phoning it in. They're Dude. just throwing in that orange and it's going to smell like an orange candy bomb. Yeah. And that's not what tequila smells like. It's not. And so my business partner and I decided we're going to come up with a book. It's a course. And, and people who, are, who decide to go through the course, you can, there are exercises in there. You send in your homework to me. You're working with me. And, and I get to mentor these people. And, and I knew some people, it wasn't going to be for everybody. You know, it, it, some people are going to just superficially going to go through it. And that's fine because we knew that. But I didn't, I, I, I was interested to see who was going to pick it up and actually go through the exercises. And to, to date, we have graduated four, uh, four students out of, the, out of the hundreds that we've sold. Because oh I, I knew that was going to be it. Okay. Um, and and we had just recently graduated our first woman, our first female catadora. Okay. And and I was so happy for for that because I've been looking for women. Um, there are right now the trend that we're seeing is a little more female-led brands of mezcal and tequila. 
and the women are getting it right. And, and, and so it's, it's kind of come full circle with, with our Babe Sabasli's book, because I think I read that quote to you from the Dalai Lama. Yes, yeah, sh- well, yeah, share the quote one more time. The quote said, the, the world will be saved by the Western woman. The Dalai Lama said that in 2009 in, in uh, Vancouver at the uh, Peace Summit. And when I saw that quote, yeah, there, the world will be saved by the Western woman. The Dalai Lama, Vancouver Peace Summit, September 2009. I said, this is it. He, he's, he, you know, we were ahead of the trend, way ahead of the trend, because I started looking for women who are working behind the scenes. You know, there's a, there's a, there's two female-led distilleries right now. One was the first one that nobody had ever heard of. You know, they were working under the radar. That you know, this is a, a the tequila industry has been a, a male-dominated industry sure. for sure. a long time. Very, very macho. Very, you know, um, and yet. Women have been leading the way secretly, quietly, in the background. They have been, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted to focus on them. Yeah. And, and now we're getting more of them. I and love to hear. I, I'm, I'm going to have to check out the course. It's Because it's funny, because as I said, Dino is literally my neighbor, and he's been talking about this course, and I didn't even put it together. And he's like, that's the course. I'm like, oh, my God. this is Because I want to get some additional intel around tequila my goal wasn't starting this podcast was to talk about intention or like really in-depth turmeric or in-depth tequila because everybody thinks it's a cooking or drinking show it's none of those it's just the juxtaposition of being all things athlete drinker that kind of stuff and really just as humans we wear so many hats but as you know i was you know eating more consciously and drinking more consciously i was getting into the minutia thing so i was so excited that there was more opportunity to learn more from people that really had in-depth truths because hailing from marketing and branding in the wellness industry, it's exactly what you're saying, like supplements and all this, they can tell you how good it is and they can go into like artificial flavoring and natural flavoring, there's loopholes. Like it's all kind of the same smoke and mirrors that you really gotta find your fellow truth seekers that you can trust because I can do a lot of research but I'll never know the depths of tequila like you do. So you've gotta find your tribe where you can go and lean on the right people and learn accordingly. But I think that's so critical as I carry on the show because our young people are so savvy that if I am going to endorse something, I really do have to have at least a a bit more than just a baseline knowledge. So I'm pumped about this course. And I actually think there will be a lot of people getting in. I'm curious, though, um, a couple of brands I knew were intentional about sourcing from female uh, distilleries were no big brands, especially now that it's marketable about marketable about diversity inclusion. No one was seeking out these female owned distilleries. Well, they, they are now. Yeah, it's a buzzword now. We were, well, yeah, it's a buzzword. I mean, we started this, I started this, this was a, um, uh, it's a compilation of, of interviews. We asked, I asked uh, five simple questions to women in the industry that I could source, that I could find. And each one answers them differently. And it's very interesting to do, and some of them, you know, in Spanish, and I had to do the translation. That was before Google Translate. Now we can get <laughs> Google Translate and help do, do most of the work. And it's neat to get into their heads. When I do translations, I get a, a feel for how they think. When you're an editor uh, of English or Spanish, you know, you, you get an idea of how that person thinks and, and where they're coming from. And then you realize if you've had their tequila, you go, oh, that makes sense now. Now I know where the intention is coming from. Because those of us who follow really female-led, female-driven tequilas or female-driven distilleries, we, we, there's something we sense as human beings that we can't either, either we don't acknowledge or we can't put words to. And I call that the, the, uh, the missing ingredient that we may be already aware of. And when you do these interviews and you see where they come from, you go, oh, there's the intention. That's the missing ingredient. That's what I was feeling. I'm not just following this brand because I know the master distiller has pedigree. I'm not just following this brand because they're family of the gada growers. I'm not just following this brand because it's organic. I'm following this brand because there's something instilled in the distillation that I can't put my finger on, Mm -hmm. but I feel, okay? And by and large, women feel it. Women get it. I I know this is going to sound funny. There's a few good men out there, like me, you know, but (laughs) for one, and there's a few others. There are there, but primarily women. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can name a couple off the bat. I'm, I just for you, for your, for your, you know, for your edification. There's one lady who has an organic brand called One with Life. She's very spiritual. 
You can find her on Instagram. You can follow One With Life. Uh, Lisa Elevich is the, the brand owner. Wonderful lady. We've interviewed her on, on our Open Bar interview uh, podcast and also in, in our Babes to Boss Ladies book. Um, there's, there's another one uh, just recent. Her name is Mara Smith. Probably the smartest lady I've ever met to own a brand. Okay. And she she actually read our book. I, when I interviewed her, she said, "Yeah, I read your book." And then when I found a mass, Mr. Distiller here, I looked for her. I found her, yes. and it took her 20 months from conception to getting it on the market. She has her own tequila called wow. In Speedo. Now, okay. to be fair, she's she's a uh, uh, a lawyer by trade. She's not practicing anymore. So okay. that's the fastest I've ever heard anybody. That helps. The, the law yeah. side helps. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you can do the paperwork on both sides of the sure. board. Otherwise, <laughs> you've got a lawyer on, on Mexico side. You have a lawyer in the America side. And, you know, you're hoping to get, get it done within two to five years. She did it in 20 months. Wow. And that I have to brand, look the brand up. That brand is, it's not so soft. That brand has got guts. Okay. And, and it's called Inspiro, if you can find it. But that'll give you a good, a good, you know, a good base. And there are others. There, there's, there's a few others that are my personal favorites. And every, every line that they produce for a brand owner has a different flavor profile. And, and they don't bite off more than they can chew. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's the, the, the two female led uh, distilleries. One does uh, what they call contract brands for other owners, but they don't do more than, I'll be surprised if she's got more than 15 brands coming out of that distillery and each one is different she's not going to expand more just to make more money yeah. she's going to make them to make sure that that her customers are happy yeah. and i've had several from her distillery and they're they're all different different flavor profiles okay and, and it takes you know we were the first ones to start writing about them then the new york times wrote an article on on uh, the lady is not no her, her name is meli barajas and she owns a uh, Vinos y Licores um, is the name of the distillery. And they wrote about her and the whole thing just boomed. And wow. you know, what's funny is that because we had written about her before, we got a whole lot of hits thanks to the New York Times. So we, okay. we scooped the New York Times. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. When I, I love it when a plan comes together, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so, so now everybody's seeking that because they understand the missing ingredient. They they feel it. They they can place it in mezcal. It's it's very interesting. I uh, one of my clients just recently came back from a fact finding mission in in, in Oaxaca, and they took so many pictures and, and uh, they reported back to me and and um, so we were tasting all these samples because they want to bring a mezcal to market, and um, one of the partners they're they're all women, all three of them. And uh, one of the partners took a picture of the fermentation tank. And usually it's just, it's just a big wooden vat, okay? And it's got the plant fibers on top. And inside in the middle, they, they post, they, they post a, a cross, okay? And yeah, many of them uh, are Catholic, you know, sure. or, you know whatever, but, but it's the spiritual part of it. Yeah. In other words, they've taken care of the plant. They've nurtured it. They've brought it, you know, they, they've harvested it in, in a respectful way. They've, they've, they've done all the labor they possibly could. And then they put it in the fermentation tank and it's up to God, God, yeah. the universe, the, the saints, the souls, whatever, whatever you're, you know, whatever. We say God, universe, Madonna on the show. So yeah, like whatever exactly. you believe God, universe, exactly. because I'm a huge Madonna that, fan. So, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> One of my favorite guys who, who's a very spiritual man himself, uh, Ron Cooper, who brought the first mezcal into market. And I met him doing our show because not knowing anything about mezcal, he was actually a neighbor of mine living in Taos. Wow. So that's where he lived. And he was an artist. And he was the first one to bring mezcal to market. And there's a, one of my favorite videos is of him talking about how every thousand meters in the air, there are microorganisms that influence and affect what goes into the final product of mezcal while it's fermenting. Mm -hmm. That's what they call wild yeast, wild fermentation, where you don't do anything. You don't, you're not throwing bread yeast in there, or you're not using champagne yeast, which is what some brands will use. You're just letting your, your environment, where your distillery is located, 
If it's a nice microclimate, you got fruit trees, all that influences what goes inside. And, and uh, there's a quote uh, of his that I, I like using that, you know, um, industrially made, uh, anything made industrial does not allow for, does not, a lot, that, I'm paraphrasing here, it does not allow room for God, yeah. okay? Or, or the universe or whatever. And yeah. so, you know, that to me, that's the missing ingredient that we get. Uh, I, I lurk on Reddit a lot. And there's a lot of fanboys out in Reddit who have, who, who love Mescal and they're following this, this hand of the maker and that maker and that distiller, you know, but there are a lot of guys. They're all guys. They're not very few women, if any, belong to some of these subreddits. And they're following them, but they're, they're not, and you know they're they're getting the flavor profiles and they're getting how great they are, but they're not. They're sensing something. Yeah. There's a reason why you're following these guys, and that's because their intention is part of that fermentation process. The intention is part of the distillation process. The intention of the maker is part of the bottling process, and that's the missing ingredient that we're not acknowledging. The I love that. The mainstream tequilas do not acknowledge that, okay? They don't. Um, you know, yeah, they're great gateways. You know, everybody wants to drink what The Rock is drinking. Everybody yeah. wants to drink what, you know, I want to be cool like George Clooney, you know? Yeah, but I think our, our our companies, and I hope these companies, like, are really, that's, it's so funny because I do marketing and branding, so co companies come to me and, like, like, what do we do? How do we tell the story? And I'm like, well, tell me the truth. And oh, I, I say this, and it's hard for my big companies to really digest this, but I'm very creative. I'm talented at what I do, deeply confident. And whatever your truth is, is far better than anything I can ever create. And people don't, they, it's really hard to embrace that. And, you know, there are muddy waters around spirituality, whatever, but on the flip side, our younger consumers want to know the truth. And it doesn't matter if they're Jewish and you're Catholic and we're collectively joining over the spirit. It doesn't matter. It, the point is like people like that intention and it matters so much. It's almost like we're going back to like the tribal days or um, very Eastern practices like green tea and all the spirituality and tradition that goes into different foods or drinks or whatever. People People want to know that and that intentional conversation around it. I think people will buy it. I, in fact, I know our young people will buy it because they trust the brand more than they love it. And there's actually a phenomenal study, the Edelman study that talks about, um, I've given a few speeches around it, uh, young people in particular buying because they trust something over, they love it. It's scientific, like qualified data you can look at and unpack. But long story short, I hope these companies are really sharing all this story and all like the cross in the fermentation or the distillery process because people really adhere to that. And like, I think they really latch on and they feel part of something bigger than themselves. And that's your marketing. And what's so cool is it's not made, it's the truth. Like it's not marketing shady. It's just showing up the truth. Yeah. I mean, you have to be careful though, how you word stuff like that, being the copywriter. Yeah. I, you know, because you, you, you can, again, I, I get sent fluff all the time, um, you know, from people who, you know, a copywriter is just somebody who, who's given information and they translate it the, the best way they know how, but they don't know anything about, you know, what, mm -hmm. what it is. And, and so sometimes you get the information correct and sometimes you slant it to where it sounds like, oh, this sounds really woo woo. You know, yeah. why, why am I, why, why am I getting this? You know, and you don't want to, you don't want to overemphasize that aspect, but I, but I overemphasize it when it comes to tequila tasting, when I teach mm -hmm. that, that, you know, uh, some people that I teach will never go to a distillery. They'll never go to a, a mezcal distillery, a tequila distillery. They won't, they won't know one from the other, but, but they're interested and they want to have some sort of basis. And that's where I, I show the, the techniques for tequila tasting, because it's very, it's what we're doing. It could be, it could be, I swear, it could be anything. It could be uh, my cup of coffee. It could be your yeah. protein shake. If you look at it, there are three facets you look at when you, when you, judge a tequila one you look at sight you look at what it looks like the legs and tears and i can pour some and show you and the second thing is the aroma what am i smelling what am i getting you know and and some people are kind of put off by snobs who have oh it smells like uh, one lady asked me how do you how do you get you know it smells like avocado peel and i go well you know some of theirs are just are, that's how they're trained they're trained to take buy fruit and let it rot so that they can, so they can know what what rotting fruit smells like, or an overripe fruit smells like. But you know, sometimes that's over the top. Yeah. My, what I tell people when I teach them, I say, "Your descriptors. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for a descriptor. 
your descriptors, the, the best ones are the ones that you come up with because the, the aroma smell is the closest thing uh, is very closely associated to memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the best descriptor I ever got was from a guy who said, wow, this tequila smells like, I remember running through my, my mom, my grandma's lilac wow. bushes when I was a kid. It's like, oh man, that's it. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, or you smell rosemary, you know, some stuff like that, or you smell orange blossom, you know, whatever it is that whatever memory that's associated with that, that you, that, that, oh, you own it. Okay. Yeah. So that's the best, best descriptor. Don't worry about what everybody else, you know, the, the, the sommeliers and, and, and the, the cigar smokers and, and all the, all those guys who are paid to, to give you their, their, their written opinion. You know, the best ones are the ones you come up with because they're just as valid. Okay. Cause some people are kind of put off by that. They're, they're kind of scared. It's like, I, I don't know. Am I, I going to get vanilla out of this thing? Yeah. You know? And, and so we, as much as we possibly could, we have, you know, we, we have the course that'll, that'll teach you from the, you know, from field to glass, from the ground up. And it, it depends on how much you want to get your hands dirty. We have an exercise in there where maybe you don't cook. You know, I, I know women that don't cook. I don't cook, but I, I know women that do. And I, I've had to raid, you know, uh, spice cabinets just to, just to smell what, you know, what yeah. cinnamon t smells like. And, and you go to a bodega, you know, and all those smells, you, uh, the dried chili and you know, having lived in New Mexico, there's like three smells I, I love. One, that lilac bushes, uh, uh, Spanish broom uh, and roasting green chili, you know, because you, you already, when you smell roasting green chili in the air, you already know it's August. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so those are those descriptors are as, as valid as the ones you see written down, you know, on a label of a tequila a bottle or, or ones you come up with. And so, and, and the last one is the last facet that you is taste. What am I tasting? Am I tasting the same thing that I was smelling? You know, and what you're doing is you're slowing yourself down. You are becoming, um, you're becoming more aware. You're more in the moment and you're literally it's, it's mindfulness. Yeah. And, and I think when I, when I sent this, this information to you, I said, it's, it's finding Zen in your bottle of tequila, or I call it transformational tequila tasting. And what you're doing is you're slowing yourself down. Yeah. You're, you're being in the moment, you're appreciating what it is that you're, whether it's a good tequila or a bad tequila, it doesn't matter. You're appreciating the, your, your senses. And by, by appreciating that, it expands you so that you actually start to feel grateful. Yeah. You start to, there's gratefulness involved. So it's, it's mindfulness that you're, I'm actually teaching mindfulness and I, and I'm just using tequila as the vehicle. Totally. Okay. It, it's just like, it's like a tea ceremony. You ever, you ever see a tea ceremony, a Japanese tea ceremony? Oh yeah. Yeah. Weddings you know and stuff. Beautiful Absolutely. Those are? Yeah. They're so beautiful that, you know, you hold the, 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 the tea in, in you know, in the, in the way they prepare it. And it's like, Oh my God, that's so beautiful. Yeah. You know, and to be a part of that, you, you feel that you sense that during the pandemic, we saw an increase in alcoholism. Mm -hmm. We saw an increase in, in people buying liquor, right? The liquor stores were open. Uh, we saw what drove the market was expensive tequila. People were drinking better. That's how they were. They, that, that's how they were skewing that headline. <laughs> people were drinking better. No, man, we're drinking more. There's exactly. alcoholism, there's depression. You know, you couldn't go out, you couldn't go to work, you couldn't drive anywhere. You know, what am I going to do? I'm going to want to sit here and get slammed. I'm going to get, you know, snockered. And that's kind of when we, this book took off. We, we actually wrote it uh, right before the pandemic. We, toward the tail end of 2019 was when we finished. And we saw an increase in people buying the book because they wanted to, you know, some of them were really good students. They were mixologists who were out of work, you know, bartenders. Uh, people in the service industry, uh, hobbyists, everybody that, you know, uh, people in the, in the, in the distri distribution, uh, a part of the industry. And they were trying to learn more so that when they came out of this, they could, they could sell better. All right. Yeah. Great. Um, but I, you know, the other headline, the other flip side of it, you know, uh, you know, wellness, um, uh, mental wellness, for instance, that that suffered a lot because people couldn't go there. They, they, you know, until Zoom, uh, they couldn't go to their weekly meetings or they couldn't, you know, seek help. And so 
trying to trying to put that all together and try to teach a little bit of you know slow yourself down be one be at one with whatever it is and like i said it could be coffee it could be anything i'm using tequila because that's my field but it i'm i'm trying to uh impart having people feel feel the the missing ingredient yeah being grateful for it and being more aware I love it. And, and so, you know, so it comes full circle. There's a spirituality. There's a reason they call it spirits. Okay. Really, there is. You know, uh, it was invented by the Moors. And, and you know, that was alchemy back in, in the Middle Ages. And so it was, you know, people discount all that. But I think it's coming full circle, as you mentioned. I think that the newer generation, you know, um, you have to be careful with the story. Someone yeah. told me uh, not too long ago that that whole that whole story about Casamigos and how it all came together that was all part of the business plan. Oh, it was all marketing. It that still was all is. Marketing. I didn't know it's, that. I, oh yeah, I it's, were, well, you, know, you know Paul Mitchell, bit, the whole yeah, backstory of Paul Mitchell and everything, and Patrina yeah, and but, music videos. Yeah, yeah, they may have been. You know, maybe they were neighbors. You know, they had houses next door to each other. They knew each other, but maybe they didn't sleep. You know, over at each other's house. You know, they didn't buy a house together. You know. They, George didn't go to Randy's clubs, things like that. They they built that story. They they manufactured it. It was yeah. it was you know it was all part of the business plan. And I didn't know that you know because the way it was the way it was presented was like oh yeah you know George got drunk one day and he climbed to bed with Cindy Crawford. Come on, you know. <laughs> um, so 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 you have to be careful how you construct that story. And like yeah. said, I love I love the way you're coming from it because you you say tell me the truth. Right. Cause and that's all you need. Yeah. That's all you really need. And yeah. I love, I love the circle of the intention, awareness, connection, mindfulness. I love it. This is a perfect juxtaposition of on our show of Timberland Tequila of kind of like bringing mindfulness to tequila. Cause that's really what it's about. Regardless of what you're connecting over, you said it's like heart space, finding like-minded humans and connecting over something. And I really do believe and know our young people do care about that and consciously consume accordingly. I think they will seek out stuff that where it is that, and you think mindfulness and tequila, how does that fit? I think our young people actually get that. Hopefully they're over 21, uh, at least here in America. (laughs) But, um, but I think they really get it. So it's very much a conscious conversation. And while, you know, in this day and age, we are very conscious on how we project those messages. I actually think down the road, we won't have to be as conscious talking about spirituality and connection and, and in the brand, because that will, the, the consumer will flip where we're right now. We're kind of, we got to tiptoe around some things down the road. I think they'll care. And even if like, again, we're different religions to, as a religious person, people will understand like, Oh, that's so cool. They are prideful about their message. And I'm here to entertain with, even if I don't believe in the same thing, read the same book, whatever, they will appreciate intentional people supporting what they genuinely believe in. So I think we're at like this cosmic shift. And so I love that people People like you are on, um, on the mic, on the camera, sharing your voice because we are in this transition. We've got traditional people that have, that have always thought a certain way, did things a certain way, and then we've got our young crew doing whatever they want, labeling it however they want, living however they want, which I love. And so we're at this crossroads. So it's cool that people like us get to, you know, have these conversations that get to kind of usher that through, regardless if it's tequila, turmeric, traveling, whatever. Um, but I think it's great. And I love, love, love the ethos and the history of the tequila industry. I can't wait to learn more. I'll definitely have to check out the course and see everything that you have going on because I, I appreciate how you are pr- approaching it so deeply um, and intentionally. It's, it's been a big part of my life, uh, j- just as, just as a health and health and fitness. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I think I, I may have told you off camera, I was, I was a health instructor and yeah. uh, years ago. Uh, one of the few things my dad actually taught me was how to work out. And, um, you know, it's interesting to me how you, we were talking about this off camera now, how, how for a lot of athletes, uh, a lot of, a lot of marathon runners, you know, tequila is like part of that good, healthy diet mm-hmm. because, um, in the old days and depending on who, what brand you're drinking, tequila is actually, um, one of the, one of the best slow foods there is that plant if it's done correctly, is in the ground at least five years, Mm -hmm. okay? If it's harvested correctly, sometimes longer, depending on the, on the brand and who's, and who's the agave grower. And so it's the ultimate slow food. And, um, we were talking, I I think off camera, I was telling you, I've got some friends who were bodybuilders and and one of them said, yeah, I, 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 one of them told me years ago that they, um, before I go on stage, I'll take a shot of tequila. 
And, yes. and, I, and I thought to myself, okay, that's because of the vet, the shot of sugar that goes through there and it helps in the vascularity. So you're, you know, you look more impressive on stage. Okay, I get that. And I said, what tequila are you drinking? Well, it's that tequila. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Don't do that. Try as 100% agave tequila. The sugars are slower. While you're doing your routine, you're not going to spike and then crash. Because that's the that's the tough part about about a mix though is that you'll spike, you know you'll you'll get amped up with because of the sugar and then you'll you'll die you'll spike and be hungover too you'll yeah be hungover too yeah. yeah especially if you've not had any up until that very point before you go on stage mm-hmm. so try that 100 percent of guy and he and he did and he he liked yeah, the effect it was way better so so if you're gonna it's inside baseball folks for those of you who are gonna compete uh, take a shot of 100 a good blanco tequila. Not not the aged expressions, just just blanco, just unaged. That's my favorite one. Yeah, I love yeah, and, it. Yeah, and and just take that before you go on stage and watch what happens. I you love know? this. There's so much intel I want to unpack. We might even have to do a part two. But give us like one main myth before we wrap up um, about tequila or like tequila truth that you think people should know that they don't know. Oh God, uh, there's so <laughs> many of them. You know, you know those headlines you see like a like a, we're we're taping this or recording this uh, before National Tequila Day, which is July 24th. Oh, okay, noted. Yeah, and and. Um, You'll see a lot of a lot of articles that say, you know, the 10 health benefits of tequila. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're either they're either tongue in cheek, where you know it makes you more bold, you know, it makes you less smarter, you know, better looking. Yeah, it makes yeah. you dance, you know, stuff like that. And then you see stuff like, oh, well, it's actually good if you're diabetic. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, because it, it doesn't care, just the sugars are cien por ciento sugar. Well, okay, it's not. Okay. Your body will digest that as any other sugar. Oh. But there's there's less. Sugar, you'll you'll see some some of them that, that will say, uh, oh yeah, it's it's really good for um, uh, it's a probiotic. No, it's not. Okay, the inulin that is produced when you shred when you shred a blue agave, that is a probiotic. That is all distilled out. Okay. Your tequila. Okay, so you'll get a lot of these health benefits that if you look on WebMD or you talk to somebody <laughs> that knows, you know, that's all bullshit yeah, um, yeah you know uh, there's there's a there's two books called the tequila diet two of them one of them says you know how it one of them is completely bad the other one's a cookbook okay you can cook with tequila that's always good sure um i, I would i would I, I think that's the one that, that really irks me is that you know um uh that it's that great for diabetics it's great for a healthy diet okay yeah. the probiotic on it that you get that they make the blue agave industry makes more money selling to big pharma. Okay. Uh, the agave syrup and uh, uh, organic ag- agave is used in baking, the baking industry. Yeah. Yeah. I cook with all that. But yeah. in order to make that, you have to have a diffuser on site. Okay. okay. And, and um, some, some, uh, this, I won't even call them distilleries. Some some plants, uh, some uh, manufacturing plants that are based in Jalisco, um, are multi-certified. In other words, they have the kosher certification. They're halal. They're USDA certified, and they produce organic agave syrup, organic what they call concentrate, organic blue agave concentrate that they ship into the United States. And micro distillers buy those, and they produce their own blue agave spirit okay and some of them do it quite well other ones if they do it with with organic agave syrup uh uh or or nectar it comes out tasting like a little bit like rum uh, i know that there's a few a few in colorado a few micro distillers in colorado they're doing that um so you know you really have to do the research yeah you know go back and, and maybe next time you and i talk i can show you i can walk you through what it's like to read a tequila label or oh, something yes. and, okay. and stuff like that. So that you, yeah, as an aware consumer, we, we talk about it in the book as well in the course, but you know, it, it's always nice to demonstrate what do I look for? Because even then 
you have loopholes in the regulation. Yeah. Can you, is that, is that a long conversation? Can you tell us that? No, I can show you right now. Okay. Uh, I think I, that's I, really great. Cause I was going to ask you, what's the purest one? Like, just tell me what is the cleanest company, but or is there even one that exists? Uh, I would, <laughs> there, let's put it this way. There is, uh, and you're asking, you're, you're, you're asking, let, let's put it this way. There is one distillery with a gnome number. Now, let me give you the let me give you the, the ins and outs of a gnome number. First, let me okay. show you where, where it's at. Every, every tequila label needs to have that number and that, that it says NOM and then the number. And then it says CRT. The CRT is the governing body of tequila, El Consejo Regulador de Tequila. They, they, they police the rules and regs. They write them, they police them. Okay, they're supposedly a nonprofit organization. <laughs> And um, every distillery has a number assigned to them. Now, here's the loophole. Within the rules and regulations, it is allowed for one distillery to buy tequila, bulk blanco 100% tequila from each other, okay? In order to meet demand. So just because you have a gnome on it, it does not, it does not um, uh, determine where it's being where it's being made, only where it's being bottled. Okay. Okay. Now some distilleries will say produced and bottled, but they all they all fall under that same regulation. Um, I know for a fact this is a, a small brand that I'm looking at right here because those are the only ones that, that we look at are our, our startup brands, small brands, mom and pops. Um, and I know that they produce their own tequila. So I know, yeah. I'm fairly confident that they don't buy bulk Blanco tequila from other distilleries. They can, but they don't. Right. Because they, own, they, they usually blue, uh, agave growers that have their own distillery don't have any reason to buy Blanco unaged tequila from anybody else. Okay. There's one distillery that's getting the bulk of, of the uh, organic brands out there it's gnome 1480 that's their number okay uh, uh, oh it's called destilleria las americas okay and they are agave growers a family of agave growers they've been doing it for a long time 1480 1480 okay uh the the young lady i mentioned earlier uh one with life that's where she has her tequila made yes okay it's organic um there are a few other ones that maybe uh, um, aren't organic, but, but they're just as good. Um, but anyway, uh, that would be, I think, a good start for anybody okay. who's looking. Uh, there are kosher tequilas. Uh, people look, at, look for kosher as well, and that's, that's just as valid a market. The, the kosher market's a $1 billion market. So it's one that, it's one that you don't want to not be in. Right, right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, 1480 is also not only organic, but kosher. Okay. certified and, and are these like all brands like is it easy to find yeah um again in the course we show you how to look this up on, okay. the, on the crt website there's an app out there you can use and download i i don't particularly care for apps because of the the data breaches that are that are yeah. that are they're susceptible to uh <laughs> and plus i know a little bit more about that um that particular app than i than i should um, so I do my own research and that's, okay. that's what I'm hoping that, that I accomplish with the book is that people delve into their own, do their own research, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, get curious enough to, to, to source things out on their own because some, you know, we're so spoon fed, you know, this, I mean, we're even TikTok, you know, you got four minutes, you, you, you we did, a, we did an hour, maybe longer right now. And we'll be lucky if we get a few views, you know, people, <laughs> people have that attention span is about four or five minutes. And that's why you have TikTok and you have, you know, yeah. uh, Instagram and all that. But I'm looking for somebody who's more curious and it's yeah. going to do their own research because there's so many of us that are spoon fed stuff and we can spoon feed you the wrong information. Absolutely. You know? Just because it's coming from me doesn't mean anything. 
Right. Do their right. own research. But hopefully you, know? you can find like your two secrets. I agree with you that, about everything, not just tequila, like find your own stuff. But if you really do, you we can't know everything. So if you can find your truth tellers and build that tribe, I think that's awesome. Mike is one of those. So Mike, tell us um, where you're from or where, where you're from, where you're, uh, where we can find you and um, how we can link up on this course. I'll of course have all these details out, but I want people to get um, to know where, where you're coming from, because I really think you will have some people reach out that really do want to know the depths of tequila. And, and there's so much, to know. I'm super curious about the bottom, all of it. And I, as being on the mic, I feel a responsibility to learn more. So tell us where you're at. Uh, you can find us uh, on tequila Uh, just type in tequila aficionado or Mike, Mike Morales tequila. Uh, I I'm like a virus. I'll pop you're up everywhere. <laughs> The uh, magazine, a, the show. Yeah, we, we have a magazine. Uh, obviously, you can see our YouTube uh, channel is called Sipping Off the Cuff. It's on our YouTube channel and also available on, on our website. Uh, if, you, if you're if you listening to us or watching us on Spotify, we're on Spotify, Amazon Music, uh, YouTube, obviously. Um, anywhere where you download your podcast, iPod, you know, uh, we're, we're available there. We're like in nine different platforms. So you can listen to us. You don't have to watch us because you know, we're not that attractive. Um, but you know, but yeah, we'll, it's fun. It, it, it's something yeah. we'll do, uh, this July will be the, be, uh, our 23rd year in drinking online folks. Con- we invented <laughs> Congratulations. We're doing it. Thank you. Yes. And, that's and- you right on time with the pandemic, but check these guys out. I love the energy. Again, I love the truth and the ethos and like the mindset around all this. This is what we need in marketing and branding. So that transitions into our mindfulness in life. If that's to start with mindfulness and tequila, you know, we're here for that on turmeric and tequila. So I love it. Check out what these guys have going on. Mike, I love the passion and energy. We will certainly wrap more about this because it's been, I haven't really intentionally looked out my tequila pros, but a few have come into my world like Dino. So we're going to continue to unpack this because I think there is um, more misinformation to disrupt, but also like the flip side, the really good and like the heart and soul that goes into the spirit and how it goes. So it, there's just so much good there. So we'll continue to unpack it. But until then, I appreciate your time and energy and um, we'll wrap again soon. You bet. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate you, your energy, your time. Uh, you know, be careful with the, well, the CrossFit because you scare me with all that weight. <laughs> I will, I will. She's an animal, by the way. If you haven't seen her on her Instagram, check her out. This <laughs> this lady is no joke, man. She's Oh my God. We're trying. Uh, we keep we keep the turmeric close and the tequila for all the heavy. There days. you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Let's talk soon. Yes. Thanks so much, Mike. Bye. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.